Well, here we are in a great place that brings me so many memories. We're on the Sunset uh, Sound Studios lot. Mm -hmm. And for the last almost 10 years, uh, since pre previously taking over Studio One here for years, one of his favorite places to record drums and a lot of other things. Joe Ciccarelli has a cottage here where he can do tracking and mixing and be really comfortable. So I'm really fortunate that he took uh, some time today and is willing to talk to us about how he ran into the whole idea of mics make a difference. Often, as Wally Heider taught me, my first mentor over at 6000 Sunset Western Recorders, often they are all the difference between something that you don't have to work hard on in the mix and you really work hard to fix it in the mix. True, yeah. Well, I, I'll, I'll say the, the one thing a very um, uh, early on mentor in my life taught me in terms of making a difference, changing sounds. Um, he said, if you want the greatest difference in a sound, the first thing you do is change the musician because really the sound is in the musician's hands. But if you don't have the ability to change the musician, for instance, most of the time I'm dealing with bands and you're not gonna change the musician in the band, maybe in rare cases you do, but it's a little, little tense if you have to do that. So you can't change the musician. But the second greatest difference you can make is changing the instrument. So if you've got a guitar that's too bright, you want a sound that's darker, you use a guitar that's darker. But the third biggest change he said you can make is the microphone. And then everything else falls down the line in order. In other words, the preamp makes a difference, the EQ makes a difference, the compressor, et cetera, et cetera. But the one, as a producer or as an engineer, the one thing that you have the most control of is changing the microphone. And that's a lot easier thing to do than change the musician or perhaps ask a musician who's very comfortable with his instrument to change that instrument. So the first thing you're gonna do is run out to the studio and if you need a darker sound, you get a darker microphone. If you need a brighter, more airy sound, you find a condenser that has a nice open top end. So, you know, you learn to make those big changes with, with the microphones first in the studio. So that's when I started being aware of the differences in microphones. Certainly I worked with a lot of engineers when I was very young and watched them work and what microphones they chose for, for what instruments and what types of music. Um, and their choices were always different, never always the same. Uh, so, you know, you start to um, amass this list of uh, situations and you know when when this guy was doing a jazz date he put a 67 on the the the, um, the 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 trumpet but when he was doing this big band date he put a 77 uh, on the trumpet you start to realize oh when the guy's blowing stronger and more powerful and perhaps more brassy you want something that tones it down, rounds it out, so you grab a ribbon microphone. But when you have something that's subtle and wants detail and air, you grab a condenser microphone. So you, you start to learn all those things when you first start engineering. You know, I, I think you know my first um, real understanding of microphones probably was when I was a, a teenager and bought my first uh, stereo reel-to-reel -reel, um, recorder. I would record my friend's bands or my guitar playing or whatever it was. And of course, it, it came with those cheap little microphones that whatever um, Super Scope or Ampex or whatever tape recorder I had, um, had, you know, you, you 
as you got into recording, you started to say, okay, well, how can I improve the sound of my recordings? And you, I don't know, look at the recording tape you're using and you start to look at pictures of people in sessions and you're realizing they're not using those cheap microphones that you're using. So you start to invest a little money in microphones and you up your game and then you start to say, oh my gosh, the difference between my bad guitar playing on this microphone and this microphone is night and day. So you understand the importance of it at that point in time. Uh, but I think, you know, really, uh, I was fortunate to have a lot of great mentors. When I moved to California, um, I worked at Cherokee Studios with the Rob brothers and D. Rob and Bruce and Joe all were very kind to me and really schooled me a lot. And I would watch their sessions and, you know, those, those studios were just an amazing place to be, kind of like Sunset, where, you know, one day you'd have Barbara Streisand in one room, the next day it was the Bee Gees, the next day it was Phil Collins, the next day it was Journey, and you really worked with A-level talent and A-level producers. I was assisting George Martin and Roy Thomas Baker and so many great producers that really kind of, you know, wrote the, the, the book for making rock records. So I, I was very, very fortunate. And, and of course, you know, you, you try to emulate your, your, your mentors and see what they did and you steal their, their tricks, if you will. And, and of course you, if you're smart, you learn fast that you can't just do what they did. You have to be aware of why they did it. And either you have to sort of put yourself in their head and understand why they chose the 67 versus the 77 in that case, or whatever the choice was, you kind of had to get into their psyche and realize what they were going for sonically and, you know, why they chose that instrument, that microphone, to capture that sound. You know, to me, it's all a bit like making a movie or painting. I really equate it to a lot. As you, you choose your, your palette of colors, your palette of tones, your, your light, your dark, your, your... All those things add up to making a recording. You know, you're really trying to create a world. You're trying to create this, this three-dimensional space out of two boxes. I mean, granted, the, the world is, is changing and, and, you know, we have Atmos and everything else and there's more dimension to audio now, but you really are trying to create a very, very dimensional image in a not so dimensional space. So you have to use a lot of those tricks. And sometimes it actually is distance from the microphone. Sometimes it's the microphone itself because one microphone will be more present, more detailed, and it will allow something to come forward. Uh, if you're recording a singer that's got a lot of detail and beauty and, and air in their voice, you want a microphone that captures all that. Conversely, if you've got somebody that's maybe got a gruff voice and a little, little hard on the ears, you want to soften that. So you have to find a microphone that doesn't have that detail. So, you know, these are your, your tools, your instruments, and you really, you know, pick and choose how you use a microphone for the sound that you really want to capture in your head. Well, you're very parallel to many in terms of no noticing the nuance because that ability to pick the right mic for the right place is, instead of, oh, this one will do everything like at one point uh, Gordy tried to do at um, Motown in Detroit. <laughs> I've had talks with some of the Motown people, Cal Harris and um, John Went, who were, you know, early and late at the um, Motown Detroit. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's truly amazing to observe all the things they went through as they invented what um, John Went 
felt were after he came out here. He said, you know, we were doing really great work there. And other than Gordy wanted to be in the film industry, hmm. uh, there are a lot of reasons we should have just stayed there. Wow. Because there was a whole culture and players who would come in yeah. who were at the level. The musicians, the singers, the arrangers, the songwriters were, were fantastic in that world. I mean, what a, they, they were just in the middle of this talent pool that was incredible. And, you know, when you realize the, the tools that they had or what they didn't have and how they improvised. And um, you, when you see, uh, I don't know if you've seen the new UA uh, Hitsville uh, Echo Chamber. John Webb well, yeah. was back there. I, I introduced Universal people to John Wentz. Ah, nice. And uh, John was one of the few reasons I could imagine moving back there when Cal offered me a job hmm. because I looked at the weather yeah. and my three year old Mercedes and having a girlfriend here and went, why do I want to move? Yeah. And then I, I looked at some of the technology they developed and went, wow. Yeah. And I didn't have the courage to do it. And I now, when I'm talking to classes and such, I say, when you're young, this is the time to fail. This is the time to go find out, I hate this, I love this, because you got time to burn. Mm -hmm. yep. And more energy. Mm -hmm. You know, I came up in the 80s, and in the 80s, it was a time where everybody was making... Um, Oh, more cinematic, more surreal, more, um, the, it wasn't about capturing a, a sound or, uh, an, or a black and white image. It was about creating something new. Yeah, and I remember that. It was also a time when uh, all the rules were meant to be broken. So... I came at, uh, in at a time, and as you know, the first artist I really worked with was Frank Zappa, who was all about being experimental and not following the rules and doing things that were very unconventional. So my, my schooling was just the opposite. You know, it was sort of how can you create something that no one else has created? How can you do something that is going to like change people's world? And it's not going to be the, the correct thing or the proper thing or the thing you learned in school. It's going to be something new. So that was always my challenge, certainly with him and what I brought forward with other artists that I worked with is, okay, how can we do something different? How can we put a new spin on this? How can we, as Frank used to say, how can we fuck this up? You know, how can we really like, you know, show people like, wow, you know, that every moment has to have that kind of impact. It has to be like, what is going on there? I've never heard this before. This is unique. This is special. This is over the top. So my, 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 my schooling was to sort of break all those traditions. And then, of course, you know, as, if, as you grow, you start to realize, okay, all right, this is the way I was taught. But boy... I love the way those Miles Davis records sound, or I love those Coltrane records, or Pete Seeger, or whatever it was as a kid that you listened to, you know, and you start to research how those records were made, and you start to think, oh, they were made in a very opposite headspace is what I grew up in. And you start to research the techniques and the, the, the things that you're talking about, the room, the ambience, the microphones, the, the clean signal path, all that sort of thing. And then you sort of steal from that, you steal from what you learned on your own and what you were taught, and then you become your own person. And it's usually a combination of lots of different approaches and lots of different techniques. And sometimes if I'm doing a record that 
wants to be a bit more pristine and uh, less altered, uh, I, I will take a very traditional approach or a simpler approach. But many times I'm taking an approach that might be very complicated and might be very irreverent in terms of the traditional approach. In other words, it might mean taking two microphones and putting them in a place where they're deliberately causing phase shift. And it might be patching them through three different compressors and two EQs and then adding some distortion on it because it's really about creating a, a painting, an image, and who cares what the process is. That's the one thing I've always said to artists, like what happens here in the studio doesn't matter. No one gets to witness that. No one knows the techniques, the rules, or the lack of rules that went into making this music. So you have to do whatever it takes traditional, non-traditional, to get the result you're looking for. So for me, I start with the end product. I start with the vision and then work backwards. I don't start with the technique and then hope to achieve something from those techniques. To me, I walk into a session going, what do I want out of this? What do I want this to sound like? What do I want this to feel like? How do I want this to affect somebody? And then I start to think, okay, well, to do that, do I want to take a more classical approach with the miking? Or do I want to use a bunch of old junker mics? I have a drawer full of old, you know, salt shakers and RE15s and microphones that in a way, sound terrible. They're very limited bandwidth wise or they're distorted or their off axis uh, response is really odd and bumpy, but they do unique things. And um, to me, uh, that's kind of what it's all about is painting that picture. Wow, that's, we've just gone through the whole thing from Recreative to creative. It reminds me when I started building studios, uh, I had built a studio for one of the limelighters. Hmm. Uh, and Alex Hasselhoff then called me and said, I just bought a big Moog synthesizer. Wow. And so I uh, knew John Stevens, and we put a John Stevens 3M hybrid machine mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. to in place of the Ampex 440. Mm -hmm. And now he had, you know, like 12 feet wide uh, Moog synthesizer. Amazing. And we redid his uh, lower level studio and set all that up. And I really loved, switched on Bach, I just thought it was astonishing. Brilliant, yeah, brilliant. So, I came from the recreative because the first mm -hmm. group I ever got to record was at the Troubadour for my radio show at Pomona College. Mm. Yeah. I just called because I was bored playing records and talked to uh, Tommy Makem at the Troubadour and said, hey, I do KSPC FM, friendly folk. Uh, would you stay late tonight and record a radio set for me? Huh. And then took the station apart because, hey, they had an Ampex 350. In this case, I loved what was done with Switched On Bach. And then Mort Garson, who did Our Day Will Come, and I'd done a studio for him, four track, uh, he thought this was cool as well. Went to a similar rig we set up, you know, echo plates, all that stuff. And so we were in creative space because it never happened before. And then, then I started realizing how wide of range these people were. Uh, you know, I was mi raised Midwest. Uh -huh. uh, we'd come out here, but they were Midwest. And um, so I'm volunteering for the AES in New York. And um, the guys know I worked on some Moog studios. And they said, oh, well, we'll have you uh, work with Carlos. 
Carlos is doing a uh, workshop on, and I was introduced to Wendy Carlos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. I went, uh, uh, okay. But that, that record, I, I remember uh, as a kid hearing that, and um, I mean, I think it turned a whole generation of people onto classical music. Oh, it's such a great that, piece. And, and I, I remember uh, being uh, in college at Boston University and being so fascinated with electronic music that there was a guy who was a very ele early electronic music pioneer by the name of Peter Fink. And he had a school in Boston called the School of Contemporary Electronic Music, something like that, and um, would offer these night classes. And he, he had early Buchlas, Moogs, ARP 2500. And it wasn't so much the instruments, but his mindset was so fascinating because it was about new sounds and he would do crazy things like get uh, little contact mics and he'd mic lampshades or pieces of metal and turn them into percussion instruments or you know get get notes from a, a, a strip of metal and then he'd string he'd record them and put together these pieces of music that were basically just notes spliced together but they were metallic notes and he'd make all these weird sounds and put them through um uh echo plexes and and stuff like this and just great texture so I, I i remember like going whoa there's rock music there's classical music there's country western now there's something electronic music it's like a whole new thing so like you know as as a 19 year old 18 year old kid that was like a whole new genre of music was was invented by walter carlos wendy carlos and um yeah the, those those albums with and the uh then I, then you of course like as I said earlier, you kind of then go back and start to research other things like uh, Beaver and Krauss and Max Newhaus that would do all of these just well, classical music. Beaver and Krauss music were the local guys for Moog, but we correspond because he loves to do nature sounds. Oh, wow. That's one of the things he just, that's what he likes to do. Huh. And the guy who designs our uh, electronics, who is retiring at this point, but had done originally custom stuff for the Eagles, then hired exclusively for a decade doing everything electrical audio for uh, Jackson Brown. Huh. Uh, mother play, was a concert pianist. His dad had been in radio and then uh, was in charge of a television station in Santa Barbara where he was raised up. Uh, this sort of thing impacts you. Sure. And Fred Fursell, the person who was, did our design work, he had a friend who was a hi-fi guy. So his whole influence on what he did was based on hi-fi. Right. And that's a different listen. Yes, it is. Yeah, and very much so. Even though like another person like that, um, Doug Fern, of course, yeah. who makes just Incredible astonishing stuff. tube stuff. A little expensive, but the best I know about. It's it's really stunning. Everything that man manufactures has got so much tone, so much size in the sound. Everything is just bigger, healthier sounding. It's crazy what he does. He's like in a whole other level. Well, what you have to realize yeah. is that it wasn't his mother who was the musician and his dad was the tech. Uh, his dad had hitchhiked from Nebraska to Pasadena. <laughs> Pasadena is where I went to Pasadena City College after uh -huh. I insulted the, from his standpoint, the dean of men at Pomona College. Yeah. I've been known to do that occasionally to people in authority. And um, the result was 
was that I went to PCC and took electronics because huh. the radio station was the most important thing to me there. Yeah. And I continued to volunteer after I wasn't a student there huh. anymore. That's how I met uh, the Clancy Brothers and Tommy Makem and recorded them with a Sampex 350. I'd taken a part out of the console and taken over, yeah. recorded after hours. 4.30 in the morning, I'm playing back this tape and Classic Brothers and Tommy knew how to do this. They'd made their own records for Merck while they were trying to break into the Broadway theater. They, they lo loved the idea that people got paid money for just standing on stage and talking. And then they figured out a thing to do with the music. Mm -hmm. And then they got Columbia threw money at it. But they'd already made their own records, so they just one mic, six, 664 electro voice, on the announce mic from the station, they just moved in, moved out. And I'm playing this back at 4.30 in the morning. And it's like being 15 years old in the middle of my friend's string band. And I went, this is so cool. How do I do this again? Uh -huh. And can I do it any better than this? Sure. And so that's the rest of my life has been that particular, I'm a re recreative guy. Yeah. But I was so strongly influenced by that whole thing with Mort Garson and Alex. Yeah. And me meeting Beaver and Krauss. Uh -huh. That I went, yeah, but there's this other stuff and it's really cool too. Yeah. And in between is the recording studio. Yeah. yeah. And I went, Okay, you know, why would I want to do something different than that? As I mentioned before, every project, I kind of go into it with a sense of really what I want the outcome to be. And I can tell you an interesting story that involves ribbon microphones and, and my mistaken big picture for an album project. Um, some years ago, uh, I got invited to work with Jack White on a solo track that he was doing. And we did a few days of work together, went really well. And um, a few weeks later, he asked me if I would be interested in doing an album for the White Stripes. And I was like, absolutely, I'm a fan. I'd love to be a part of this. Love the white stripes absolutely so i thought about it and jack and i talked about it and you know jack said he wanted to get a little bit more modern with the record but you know he had just done uh, get behind me satan and elephant and those were eight track recordings and he wanted to now do something that was a bit more adventurous gave him more opportunities so he wanted to do 16 track analog now this is 2006 or 8 whatever that was um we're already in the world of pro tools it's not like we're talking about 1970 something when it's 16 track um so I thought about the record a lot and what I wanted in a White Stripes record as a fan and what the other records had sounded like. And I thought like, wow, you know, this could be a really great opportunity for me to do something very classic, very honest, very much about two people in a room with great sounds and great performances this could be captured like a Glenn Johns record is captured. Meaning, in my mind, not a lot of microphones, classic two microphones, um, distance between the source and the microphone, not 15 drum microphones, maybe four microphones or whatever it is. So a very straight ahead, honest picture of what Meg and Jack sound like, because they're extremely powerful. They're really an incredible combination of the two players. They're magical. And um, so I really thought, like, I want to do this very straight ahead thing. 
And we got in the studio and I started to get sounds and I started to go for that picture, that photograph. And I, you know, the one thing about this job is you constantly have to go back and forth between listening to the big picture and then listening into the fine detail and stepping back and taking an overview and diving back in. So I had gotten so far with the drum sound and then I took a big picture listen and went, this is so wrong. My, my picture for this record is just absolutely off the mark. This was mid 2000s everything on the radio is now you know we're in a, a digital world everybody's using pro tools we have hip-hop records that are big low end and powerful everything is about the groove everything is about being big and intense i can't do this black and white picture thing it's boring it's it's small and light and not impactful. So I said to Jack, I, I want to totally rethink how I'm miking this, how I'm approaching the recording. And would you be patient and give me a half hour or so to reset up the drums and try a number of different things and reset up the guitar. And Jack being the gentleman and the creator that he is, went absolutely. I trust you, do your thing, go for it. So I instantly were at Blackbird Studio D, one of the best sounding rooms in the world, with tons of gear. As you know, one of the, probably the best microphone collection in the world. So I said to the Lowell, the assistant, I said, let's, you know, bring out the Fairchild compressor and the Pultec EQs and the... Um, uh, Neve uh, BCM 10 and get me a bunch of 67s, get me a couple of RCA 77s, get me some 4038 coals, and started to put many room mics up and started to mic the drums instead of four microphones, two overheads, kick and snare, it became individual tom mics, three microphones on the snare, three microphones on the kick drum, uh, an RCA behind the drums, overhead to, to Meg, plus 4038 coals down on the floor to pick up low, thick, early reflections from the drum kit. So I went from taking this natural black and white picture to now something that's really detailed and powerful and uh, nuanced. And um, we used a lot of ribbon microphones, both as ambient microphones on the kit. On some songs, we had a RCA 77 that was kind of close up by the rack tom between the snare and the rack tom, should we say, pointed at the kit and it probably went through a, a 1176 blue stripe compressor. On guitars, we were always using multiple microphones. Um, I started out miking the guitar with just 67s a few feet off the speaker cabinets, but when I realized that sort of natural picture of the guitar was no longer impressive uh, and powerful, I instantly got out the 57s, got out the coals, got out, pulled the 67s back as room mics, and took a picture that was more dimensional and more detailed and more aggressive, more outside the speakers, less about a picture back there in the speaker. It became like just a roar. And um, the funny thing is that Jack is a very intense player. He's very loud. And I don't mean amplifier volume loud. I mean, his playing is big and aggressive. And John McBride can tell you that we probably blew about six 4038s 
putting them in front of the guitar amps, even with windscreens on them. And, you know, they would start by being three inches from the cabinet and then, you know, you'd blow a, a ribbon and you go, okay, I guess I got to move it back. And you were moving it back and back to, to not blow up the rhythm, the ribbon microphone because we we're causing John McBride a lot of, a lot of cost to re-ribbon microphones. And um, then we discovered your 84s and we switched to those and use those on a lot of the guitar tracks as well. And there, you know, the thing about ribbon microphones is, in my mind, they have a built-in compressor. They're, um, there's something they do to the transient that kind of packs it into the sound and where condensers are, the, the transient is faster, it jumps out of the speaker a little bit more, and and the tone perhaps gets a little left behind in the sound. It becomes a bit more attack and less tone. And in some ways, a ribbon is almost the opposite, where sometimes you don't have enough transient, but then you combine that on a guitar amp with a 57 or a 67 back and you have a combination of that's perfect. You have the tone from a ribbon, the transient from the uh, 57 and the air from the 67. So you make this one big giant sound. But the, the magic to me in those ribbon microphones is that compression that brings the tone and the thickness and the warmth all up in your face and uh, it's not as pokey and harsh it's just warmer and it feels more approachable and um, it's quite an asset having that because uh, as you know recording instruments that have a lot of transients, be it a, a trumpet or a set of vibes, um, sometimes you end up with a sound that's very pokey and doesn't have enough character and enough body. And you have to struggle really hard via compression or EQ, whatever, to, to bring up that tone. So choosing a ribbon microphone, for me, I end up with a warmer, more full-bodied representation of the sound with less harsh transients. And again, if I feel like I'm lacking that, I'll put a second microphone and combine it in. But there's, there's a lot of advantages to using a microphone like that in that situation. So somewhere along the line, you, you helped Blackbird get into the 92s, which are what uh, Chris was using for playing for the National Anthem for the Super Bowl game. That was uh, the, the microphone he had up on his guitar amp mm -hmm. for this. Weekend. Well, you know, the great thing about John McBride at, at Blackbird is that he's a record maker. You know, it's great when you have a studio owner that is in the rooms and knows what you need out of the gear and knows what it takes to make a record. And John listens to his clients with those ears. In other words, if, if you recommend a piece of gear to him, he's going to think about, okay, is this doing something that I need? Is this doing something that I don't have in another piece of gear? Perhaps I should try this and, you know, see what I get out of it. And he does all those things. He listens to his clients and then he experiments with the piece of gear. There, in fact, just not too long ago when he was here, he was telling me about a piece of gear and just, you know, going crazy about it like a little kid with this new discovery. So that's a beautiful thing that when you really uh, work at Blackbird that 
you know studios run by a record maker oh. and it's somebody that cares about making great records and the other thing um that's fantastic about that environment is the microphones are incredible the gear collection is incredible the rooms sound stunning but like all studios like sunset sound and east west it's the people and there's a sense of community there and there's a sense of like wow you want to be here because people are experimenting they're trying to better their craft they're trying to do something that's timeless and you want to be a part of that and i think that blackbird has done that and thankfully some of these studios electric lady and as I mentioned, East West and Village and, and all that have lasted all these years have lasted because of that. Well, because of your work with White Stripes, I got a call from John McBride that said, we were trying one of your mics, you know, because they had the first A440. Yes. They have a lot of our mics they've tried. Yeah. And there's a the little one. The 92, which mm -hmm. I made for close up on guitar albums. Yeah. Um, buddy, guy likes it. We, we've all listened to it and we can't seem to blow it up. And um, so we want to buy five of them. It's great. And we want to buy five of the 88s. Great. And now the 88 is a mic you're known for. Yeah, we should talk about the 88 because I've used that for years on drums. That is part of my drums here. Uh, I know that I've used it down at Blackbird. I uh, don't remember when I first got introduced to it, but I remember putting up the microphone in front of a drum kit for the first time. And again, it has that self-compression thing, but it's thick and forward and being a stereo microphone, it's, it's wide. Uh, and I remember putting it up I don't know, three feet in front of the drum kit and it capturing all these like early reflections. You know, traditionally we put up room mics, but we tend to put them further back in the room. And in this position, it added all this thickness to the toms and the snare that it was almost like it was a piece of the drum kit that was missing but I never knew that it was missing until I heard that. And I remember blending it into the drum kit and all of a sudden it had all these resonances. I heard the wood, I heard the, the toms ringing and all this tone. And at the same time, I got a little bit more stereo image to the kit. So I, I don't recall when I've done a drum kit without it. And if I'm in a place and I don't have an R88, I'll try to grab a pair of Coles or even buyer 160s or something and, you know, make a pair that kind of gets me close to the R88. But there's something that that microphone has in the way it brings all this chest and body to the sound that uh, is really, really unique. And uh, I feel like my drum recording has gotten way better since I started using that microphone. I'm so pleased. It might have been there because they had an 88. They got on uh, Vance Powell, put them on to the A440. And this was before, because uh, Vance Vance was in the when I first started working with Jack. Vance wasn't around too much. Vance was the technician at Blackbird. He was the maintenance guy. So this would have actually been before Vance was uh, that much involved with uh, Jack or Blackbird. But whatever, um, I, I can't remember quite the chronology. But um, I, I can tell you that that microphone really became a part of the White Stripes, the Raconteurs, Manchester Orchestra, Manchester Orchestra, My Morning Jacket, many, many of the records that I've done at Blackbird and here and everywhere. <laughs> well, I've been, had the pleasure of working with some oh. of the My Morning Jacket people. Oh, they're the best. And, um, and, um, I'm just 
continually impressed that people hear what you heard, that there was just a little bit more here that had been missing. And uh, some of them go, oh, that was the sound that I always tried to get and I never could, and now suddenly I know what happened here. They used different microphones. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, you know, typically you'd put up six, eight, ten room mics, whatever it is. And I remember, I think, you know, my close pair of 4038s went away when I started using the R88. The, the 4038s that I used to put a few feet away from the kit, I think I stopped using those because I felt like the R88 in front of the kit did what the Coles did plus something else. So I haven't used that combination in a while. So yes, it, it adds something totally unique to the drum kit and something that always I've felt is is missing that just sense of wood, that sense of thickness and, and reality. Well, as I commented at the beginning of all this, Jim Keltner uh, called me just out of the blue and I, I fixed his 77, uh, but he said, I need an 88. And I went, you got that little eight foot ceiling with a 12 by 15 room? Yeah, but I work with Ry Cooter's engineer. He thinks he can make it all work. And he did. Mm. And uh, I said, why did you finally just... Oh, because I realized every time I really liked the sound of my drums, there was an 88 in the room. Wow. And I decided I probably should see, see if I can make that work for my room at home. Yeah. So um, somehow we wound up with a great microphone for drums. Yep, amazing. That and the other. I've had good luck with it on horn section as a room mic. Uh, I've had okay luck with it as, with for strings. It can be a little dark for strings, but uh, you know sometimes for a, as a quartet in front of the the quartet it works. But best luck for drums and horns. Well, dr drums and horns are important. I have people who tell me it's really good for a wide variety of things, it gets down to, you know, some people love it on grand piano. I can see that, yes. So, it's kind of like guitar mics. We originally made that 92 for a guitar mic, as a, that's what it's for. And then people like um, Marty Stewart, engineer, they just told me, yeah, but it also works really good on the acoustic. Hmm. Now, here we are with that, and we're, we need to switch to acoustic. It's the mic we have. Oh, it does that too. And yes. that's the thing that the 44 started it all, because it was the only mic you had. Yeah. So, I, having met you as a kid, handed off the stuff for Frank. At that point, I had a girlfriend who was his bookkeeper, hmm. uh, Rodman Jones. And, um, you know, these memories go back a ways. But to see what you're doing here today and to have followed your career, it's a great pleasure and an honor ah. to have been invited here. And I've learned so much from the, today's conversation. Wes, it's absolutely a pleasure, and uh, I'm glad you guys came by. And and uh, yes, who would have thought, you know, uh, as a, a a young kid engineer trying to make my way, that I'd, I'd be still here doing it, and you know, fortunate to work with a lot, a lot of amazing artists along the way. And thank you for all the tools that you've given us, and basically how you've improved this art. Really, it's been a pleasure to talk to you again. As well, it's the most fun that I know. <laughs> and as the tagline goes, what, and leave show business? <laughs> Except I am kind of leaving, but what I'm trying to do is leave as many stories by others. And I thank you so much for participating. You're very, very welcome. What we're calling Big Ribbon Stories. Well, my pleasure, I'm really glad to be a part of it.